Welcome to Country Studies. We have already described a country's historical setting, geography, society, economy and political system, and today we are going to speak about its educational system. So, Lecture 11. This week will be devoted to education in Britain. We are going to speak about school history, that is, its historical background, the present state school system, the national curriculum, higher and further education, and types of universities. The basic features of the British educational system are the same as they are anywhere else in Europe. Full-time education is compulsory up to middle teenage years. The academic year begins at the end of summer. Compulsory education is free of charge. But parents may spend money on educating their children privately if they want to. There are three recognized stages, with children moving from the first stage, primary, to the second stage, secondary, at around the age of 11 or 12. The third, tertiary stage, is further education at university or college. However, there is quite a lot which distinguishes education in Britain from the way it works in other countries. The British government attached little importance to education until the end of the 19th century. It was one of the last governments in Europe to organize education for everybody. Britain was leading the world in industry and commerce, so it was felt education must somehow be taking care of itself. Today, however, education is one of the most frequent subjects for public debate in the country. To understand the background of this debate, a little history is needed. Schools and other educational institutions, such as universities, existed in Britain long before the government began to take an interest in education. When it finally did, it didn't sweep these institutions away, nor did it always take them over. In typically British fashion, it sometimes incorporated them into the system and sometimes left them outside it. Most importantly, the government left alone the small group of schools which had been used in the 19th century and, in some cases before then, to educate the sons of the upper and upper middle classes. At these public schools, public schools in Britain are those uh, which are known as private ones, the emphasis was on character building and the development of team spirit rather than an academic achievement. Among the most famous public schools are Eton, Harrow, Rugby and Winchester. This involved the development of distinctive customs and attitudes, the wearing of distinctive clothes and the use of specialized items of vocabulary. They were all boarding schools, that is, the pupils lived in them. So they had a deep and lasting influence on their pupils. Their aim was to prepare young men to take up positions in the higher ranks of the army, in business, the legal profession, the civil service and politics. When the pupils from these schools finished their education, they formed the ruling elite. They formed a closed group to a great extent separate from the rest of society. Entry into this group was difficult for anybody who had a different education. When in the 20th century education and its possibilities for social advancement came within everybody's reach, new schools tended to copy the features of the public schools. After all, they provided the only model of successful school in that country. Despite recent changes, it is a characteristic of the British system that there is comparatively little central control or uniformity. For example, education is managed not by one, but by three separate government departments. The Department for Education and Employment is responsible for England and Wales alone. Scotland and Northern Ireland have their own departments. In fact, Within England and Wales, education has traditionally been seen as separate from training. 
and the two areas of responsibility have only recently been combined in a single department. None of these central authorities exercises much control over the details of what actually happened to the country's educational institutions. All they do is to ensure the availability of education, dictate and implement its overall organization, and set overall learning objectives. Central government does not prescribe a detailed program of learning or determine what books and materials should be used. It says in broad terms what school children should learn, but it only offers occasional advice about how they should learn. Nor does it dictate the exact hours of the school day, the exact dates of holidays or the exact age at which a child must start in full-time education. It doesn't manage an institution's finances either. It just decides how much money to give it. Learning for its own sake, rather than for any particular practical purpose, has traditionally been given a comparatively high value in Britain. In comparison with most other countries, a relatively strong emphasis has been put on the quality of person that education produces. The balance has changed in the last quarter of the 20th century, but much of the public debate about educational policy still focuses not so much on how to help people develop useful knowledge and skills as on how education might help to bring about a better society on social justice rather than on efficiency. This approach has had a far-reaching effect on many aspects of the educational system. First of all, it has influenced the general style of teaching, which has tended to give priority to developing understanding rather than acquiring factual knowledge and learning to apply this knowledge to specific tasks. This is why British young people do not appear to have to work as hard as they are counterparts in other European countries. Primary school children do not normally have formal homework to do, and university students have fewer hours of programmed attendance than students on the continent do. On the other hand, they receive greater personal guidance with their work. A second effect has been an emphasis on academic ability rather than practical ability. This has resulted in high-quality education for the intelligent and academically inclined with comparatively little attention given to the educational needs of the rest. Some of the many changes that have taken place in British education in the second half of the 20th century simply reflect the wider social process of increased egalitarianism. Egalitarianism, that is a doctrine that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. In other cases, the changes have been the result of government policy. Before 1965, most children in the country had to take an exam at about the age of 11, named as 11 plus, at the end of their primary schooling. If they passed this exam, they went to a grammar school where they were taught academic subjects to prepare them for university, the professions, managerial jobs or other highly skilled jobs. If they failed, they went to a secondary modern school where the lessons had a more practical and technical bias. Many people argued that it was wrong for a person's future life to be decided at uh, so young an age. The children who went to secondary wardens tended to be seen as a failures. Moreover, it was noted that the children who passed this exam, uh, known as 11 plus, were almost all from middle class families. The system seemed to reinforce class distinctions. It was also unfair because the proportion of children who went to grammar schools varied greatly from area to area. During the 1960s, 
these criticism came to be accepted by a majority of the public. Over the next dis uh, decade, the division into grammar schools and secondary modern schools was changed. These days, most 11-year-olds all go to the same local school. These schools are known as comprehensive schools. Pupils aged 5 to 16 in state schools must be taught the national curriculum, which made up of the following subjects. English, Mathematics, Science, Design and Technology, Information Technology, History, Geography, Music, Art, Physical Education, and a modern foreign language. The national curriculum sets out in broad terms what schools must teach for each subject. The national curriculum is divided into four stages. These are called key stages and depend on pupils' ages. Every school has national curriculum documents for each subject. These documents describe what teachers must teach at each key stage. Most national curriculum subjects are divided into different areas of learning. For example, English is divided into three areas – speaking and listening, reading and writing. The national curriculum does not include detailed lesson plans for teachers. Schools and teachers draw up their own lesson plans based on the national curriculum. National curriculum sets standards of achievement in each subject for pupils aged 5 to 14. For most subjects, these standards range from levels 1 to 8. Pupils climb up the levels as they get older and learn more. More able pupils will reach the standards above these levels, and exceptionally able 14-year-olds may reach the standards above level 8. The National Curriculum for Music, Art and Physical Education doesn't use levels 1 to 8. Instead, there is a single description of the standards that most pupils can expect to reach at the end of a key stage for each area of learning. All teachers check their pupils' progress in each subject as a normal part of their teaching. They must also assess pupils' progress in English, mathematics and science against the national curriculum standards when pupils reach ages 7, 11 and 14. The teacher decides which level best describes a pupil's performance in each area of learning in the subject. There are national tests for 7, 11 and 14 year olds in English and mathematics. Pupils aged 11 and 14 are also tested in science. The tests give an independent measure of how pupils and schools are doing compared to the national standards in these subjects. The introduction of the national curriculum is also intended to have an influence on the subject matter of teaching. At the lower primary level, this means a greater emphasis on what are known as the three R's – reading, writing and arithmetic. At higher levels, it means a greater emphasis on science and technology. There is no countrywide system of nursery that is pre-primary schools. In some areas, primary schools have nursery schools attached to them, but in others, there is no provision of this kind. The average child doesn't be in full-time attendance at school until he or she is about five and starts primary school. Almost all schools are either primary or secondary only, the latter being generally larger. Schools usually divide their year into three terms starting at the beginning of September, autumn term, spring term, and summer term. The holidays they have, Christmas holiday about two weeks, Easter holiday also about two weeks, summer holiday about six weeks. In addition, all schools have a half term or half term holiday lasting a few days or week in the middle of each term. The organization of the exams, which school children take from the age of about 15 onwards, exemplifies both the lack of uniformity in British education and also the traditional hands-off approach of British government. First, these exams are not set by the government. 
but rather by independent examining boards. There are several of these, everywhere except Scotland, which has its own single board. Each school or local education authority decides which board's exam its pupils take. Some schools uh, even enter their pupils for the exams of more than one board. Second, the boards publish a separate syllabus for each subject. There is no unified school leaving exam or school leaving certificate. Some boards offer a vast range of subjects. In practice, nearly all pupils do exam in English language, mathematics and science subject, and most also do an exam in technology and one in a foreign language, usually French. Many students take exams in three or more additional subjects. At the age of 16, people are free to leave school if they want to. There are several types of exams and qualifications for them. The first general certificate of secondary education. The exams taken by most 15 to 16 year olds in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Marks are given for each subject separately. The syllabuses and methods of examination of the various examining boards differ. However, there is a uniform system of marks, all being graded from A to G. Grades A, B and C are regarded as good grades. SCE Scottish Certificate of Education, the Scottish equivalent of General Certificate of Secondary Education. These exams are set by the Scottish Examination Board. Grades are awarded in numbers. Number one is the best mark. The next A-levels. A-levels, advanced levels, higher level academic exams set by the same examining boards that set general certificate of secondary education. They are taken mostly by people around the age of 18 who wish to go on the higher education. SCE hires, that is the Scottish equivalent, equivalent of A-levels. The next general national vocational qualification. Courses and exams in job-related subjects, they are divided into five levels, the lowest level being equivalent to general certificate of secondary education. Degree is a qualification from university. Other qualifications obtained after secondary education are usually called certificate or diploma. Students studying for a first degree are called undergraduates. When they have been awarded a degree, they are known as graduates. Most people get honors degrees awarded in different classes. Bachelor's degree, the general name for a first degree, most commonly uh, BA or Bachelor of Arts or B. S, that is a Bachelor of Science. The next, Master's degree, general name for a second postgraduate degree, most commonly an MA, that is Master of Arts. Scottish universities, however, their titles are used for first degrees. Doctorate, the highest academic qualification. This usually carries the title PhD, Doctor of Philosophy. There are no important official or legal distinctions between the various types of university in the country, but it is possible to discern a few broad categories. Oxbridge. This name denotes the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, both founded in the medieval period. They are federations of semi-independent colleges, each college having its own staff known as fellows. Most colleges have their own dining hall library and uh, contain enough accommodation for at least half of their students. The fellows teach the college students either one-to-one -one or in very small groups known as tutorials in Oxford and supervisions in Cambridge. Oxbridge has the lowest student ratio in Britain. Lectures and laboratory work are organized at university level. As well as the college libraries, there are the two university libraries both of which are legally entitled to a free copy of every book published in Britain. Before 1970, all Oxbridge colleges were single-sex, mostly for men. Now the ma majority admit both men and women. The old Scottish universities. By 1600, Scotland had four universities, 
They were Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen and St Andrews. The last of these resembles Oxbridge in many ways, while the other three are more like civic universities in that most of the students live at home or find their own rooms in town. The early 19th century English universities Durham University was founded in 1832. It's similar to Oxbridge, but academic matters are organized at university level. The University of London started in 1836 with just two colleges. Many more have joined science scattered widely around the city, so that each college is almost a separate university. The central organization is responsible for little more than exams and the awarding of degrees. The older civic red brick universities. During the 19th century, various institutions of higher education, usually with a technical bias, sprang up in the new industrial towns and cities such as Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds. Their buildings were of local material, often brick, in contrast to the stone of older universities, hence the name Red Brick. They catered only for local people. At first they prepared students for London University degrees, but later they were given the right to award their own degrees, and so became universities themselves. In the mid-twenties century they started to accept students from all over the country. The campus universities, these are purpose-built institutions located in the countryside but close to towns. Examples are East Anglia, Lancaster, Sussex and Warwick. They have accommodation for most of their students on site and from their beginning, mostly in the early 1960s, attracted students from all over the country. They tend to emphasize relatively new academic disciplines such as social sciences, and to make greater use than other universities of teaching in small groups, often known as seminars. The newer civic universities. These were originally technical colleges set up by local authorities in the first 60 years of this, country, of this century. Their upgrading to university status took place in two waves. The first wave occurred in the mid-60s when 10 of them were promoted in this way. Then in early 70s, another 30 became polytechnics, which meant that as well as continuing with their former courses, they were allowed to teach degree courses. In the early 90s, most of these became universities. Their most notable feature is flexibility with regard to studying arrangements including sandwich courses, that is, studies interrupted by periods of time outside education. They are now all financed by central government. Here are some comprehension questions for you to discuss and uh, to answer in written form, then send to Google Classroom. Thank you for your interest in country studies. Stay tuned to our YouTube channel.